We'll give a minute for anyone to switch over that needs. Good evening, everyone. My name is Neil Ramis. I'm the Director of Community Engagement and Education at the Sonoma Land Trust. I'm also joined by Ingrid Stearns and Kylie Kerr, who are keeping this ship upright and moving forward in the background. Thank you. For those of you that are new, the Sonoma Land Trust is a local nonprofit that protects land in Sonoma County for everyone's benefit. We've been doing this work since 1976 and have protected over 58,000 acres in our county so far. We accomplish our work through the generosity of our members and contributors like you. So thank you to everyone out there who has helped us protect beautiful Sonoma County for future generations. As we pursue our mission of conserving land in Sonoma County, we recognize that we stand upon the unceded ancestral lands of many indigenous peoples. We honor their knowledge, their care, and stewardship of this special place across the ages and acknowledge the deep and lasting damage that colonization has inflicted upon them. We at the Sonoma Land Trust embrace our responsibility to learn from and protect their cultural and traditional connections to the land through our programs and land protection efforts. For tonight's presentation, uh, it's scheduled to last about an hour, which will be followed by 30 minutes of question and answer at the end. You can submit your questions via the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen at any time during the presentation or during the Q&A. Questions will not be monitored out of the chat and must be submitted in the Q&A for us to see them and for me to ask Breck them. So thank you for submitting your questions. All right, for tonight, we are so excited. Um, I would like to introduce you to our featured speaker, Breck Parkman, who was born and raised in Georgia, but has made California his home since 1971. Breck retired from state service in 2017 after 40 years as a state archeologist. His work took him to all corners of the Golden State, as well as to Kodiak Island in Alaska, the Canadian Plains, the south coast of Peru, and central Siberia, among many places. Breck earned a BA and an MA degree in anthropology at California State University, Hayward. He was the founding director of the UNESCO-sponsored Fort Ross Global Village Project from 20, uh, 1996 to 2000. And he's a former research associate at the University of California at Berkeley and a past president of the Society of California Archaeology. Currently, Breck sits on the board of directors for two local nonprofits, our good friends over at the Sonoma Ecology Center and the Olin Poly People. Breck's research interests are broad and range from Ice Age megafauna to Russian America and archaeology of the Grateful Dead. His many publications address these and similar topics. His work has been featured in several hundred newspaper, radio, and television interviews, and he has appeared in various films and documentaries that have aired on PBS, BBC, and the History and Discovery channels. Breck currently lives in Sonoma Valley with his teenage son. Breck, we are so excited to have you. I see the chat. People are very excited about this topic. I'm very excited about the topic, which is why I volunteered to host tonight. So with that, I'd love to turn it over to you and thank you for being here and take it away. Thank you, Neil. And thank you everybody that's in this virtual room tonight. Looks like we have a pretty large crowd. I'll try to talk loud enough so the people in the back of the room can hear. I'm gonna be talking about the ancient forest of Sonoma County. And hopefully you can all see that on your screen. Hopefully I've got the screen up right. And I'm really looking forward to this. So without any more to do, let's get started. Now, about three years ago, I gave a very similar talk for the Sonoma Land Trust. It was a virtual talk and it was called the California Serengeti. And I took the people in the room virtually back in the past 20,000 years to see what our local wildlife looked like. And we saw mammoths and short-faced bears and saber-toothed cats and a lot of really cool animals. But tonight, we're going to go, so, oh, this is what we saw three years ago. It's sort of a, 
it's not a real photograph. It's sort of an artistic impression of what we thought we saw. But tonight, we're going to take another trip, and we're going to go back 20,000 years, maybe as much as 50,000 years if we hold out. And we're going to look at what our forest, what part of our forest looked like during the Ice Age. And here we go. Now, well, I'll tell you in just a minute. I was going to tell you what I've been working on, but that's the purpose of this talk. But before I talk about what I found, and I'm going to talk about a couple of discoveries of some really old trees I found and I've been looking at and thinking about, and tonight I want to talk about. But first, I want to talk about petrified forest. Now, over here on the left of the screen, if you can see it, it's kind of like a, a layer cake. And if you look down Silurium about 443 million years ago, that's when terrestrial plants, vascular plants, first appeared, according to paleontologists. Now, an important point, I'm not a paleontologist, but I've studied it, and I'm not a biologist, and I'm not a naturalist, or I'm sort of a naturalist, but I'm not a biologist. I took some biology classes, but I love it all, and I've read about it, and what I am I'm a virtual artist, uh, a visual artist, and I'm a storyteller. So this is a storytelling tonight about things I've learned, and in a few cases, things I've seen myself and discovered. Uh, the Devonian landscape. This is when trees first began putting down roots. Now, talking about petrified forest, here are the roots of a 385 million year old tree and they were found in a quarry in New York. The fossil roots of dozens of trees were found here in what's considered to be the world's oldest forest. Can you see the outline of the roots? Those are fossilized. Pretty cool stuff. Now, all of my slides have text, and you can probably read along with me. I'll deviate a little bit, but I did the text to make it easier for the translator and also for those who are hearing impaired. At least one of my friends is watching tonight who's hearing impaired. Here's a petrified forest that a lot of us have actually visited. This is the Petrified National Park in Arizona. And this is late Triassic, which is about 225 million years old. Everybody who's been here, raise your hand. Who's seen this forest? I just saw a lot of hands go up in my mind. Petrification. Now, tonight, I'm going to slip up and use the word fossil from time to time, but what I'm talking about truly aren't fossils, because in 50,000 years time, the plant remains I'm going to talk about have not had time to fossilize. A petrification is when an animal or a tree dies, and it's buried by sediment, and then extreme pressure turns the sediment into stone, and then the skeleton dissolves by groundwater and leaves a hole or a mold, and then minerals crystallize in the hole and a cast is formed as mineral-rich water enters the mole and leaves minerals. And then millions of years later, the fossil exposed on the Earth's surface. But it takes millions of years. This is at Yellowstone National Park. Now, I don't see my cheat sheet text on it. It's hidden by something. But if I recall correctly, these trees are about 50 million years old, and they're still standing. And maybe some of you have seen this. And then closer to home, our own petrified forest between Santa Rosa and Calistoga uh, is a privately held park, uh, basically a private park that has these beautiful fossil redwood trees that are several million years old. But what I'm going to talk about tonight is the late Pleistocene of California, let's say 20 to 50,000 years ago. Kind of the same thing I talked about three years ago when I talked about our wildlife. And in this artistic rendition, you see some of the wildlife that once dwelled in Sonoma County. So tonight I want to talk about two discoveries. And the first one was at Bodega Head. And this is an aerial photograph of the West parking lot at Bodega Head. And many, many of you have been here. And if you can see my cursor, look at the beach over here. This is the area I'm going to talk about. First of all, 
A former colleague of mine I used to work with a lot, Raj Naidu, is a paleontologist. And Raj and I were working on the Cordum Trail years ago doing a survey, and he told me about a place he had found at Bodega Head where there was fossil wood exposed or old wood. And I always kept that in mind. And a few years later, there was a big storm coming in, and I thought to go out and check and maybe salvage some of the old wood that Raj had found. And I did that in 2005, just before a big storm on high tide came and washed it away or some of it. And I found cones. There were cones associated with what remained of this tree and they were Sitka spruce cones. So here's the excavation. I took a couple of my hardworking volunteers with me as the storm's starting to come in, the tide's coming up and we took a sample of what we found. And what we found was part of a tree, actually part of the tree and cones and branches that had all got buried with it. If you can see here, this is part of the trunk of the tree. And I had, I had paleobotanists look at it and look at the cones and they identified this as a Sitka spruce. We took samples. We, we took as many samples as we could. Notice the blue clay here. I'll talk about the blue clay off and on all night. Blue clay tends to be really good for preserving fossils. And if you look through the records of the Bay Area where fossils are found, they're almost always found in blue and gray, gray clay like this. Here's some of the wood we recovered at Bodega Head. It looks like wood because it is wood. You could put it in a fireplace and burn it. It's not stone, it's not carbonized yet. Some is getting dark, but it's actual wood. But that's 50,000 year old wood based on our radiocarbon dates. On the left, you can see two modern day Sitka spruce cones. And on the right, you can see three of the cones that we recovered at Bodega Bay. They look pretty fresh once they're dried out. And here are 32 of the cones. Actually, I found 33 of the cones. And here's 32 of them. In just a little bit, I'll tell you about the 33rd cone. The 33rd cone had an interesting uh, life, uh, short-lived life, but it had an interesting life. But the other 32 cones that you see here ended up at the Museum of Paleontology in Berkeley, where they're curated along with some of the other samples from this site for future scholars to study. Um, it's not the first time Sitka spruce cones have been found in this type of context. It's the first time they've been found this far south. But here are two from Washington State. Um, these are also late Pleistocene. When we first found the cones, I wondered if they were going to be brewer spruce, because brewer spruce do show up in sites further north of here. But the brewer spruce cones tend to be a little larger, and these have been identified that we found as Sitka spruce. This is the natural range of brewer spruce to the north here. Now, here's another aerial photograph of Bodega Head. And I've written on this that fossil trees are visible in the cliff face at Bodega Head. If you go for a walk, and there's a trail, and some of you have done it before, that kind of encompasses Bodega Head. And you park in one of the parking lots, you walk right around, and you can end up in another lot or come back. And the trail, if you can see my cursor, follows the, the cliff face. You want to be safe. You don't want to look over and fall because it's a long way down. But if you get to a place where you can carefully and safely look over and look down, especially if you have binoculars, you'll see dark pieces of trees sticking out up and down the cliff face. Look down about 50 feet down and you'll see them. It's pretty remarkable. There's a forest there. Um, years ago, I talked to some of my state park friends and to helping me recover those because I knew there was no way I was going to go down 50 feet down a sheer cliff and recover fossil trees. But our rangers, our park rangers, have to do cliff rescue. And from time to time, they do training. And that's what you see here. We set up a training exercise for the rangers where they rappel down the cliff. And instead of rescuing fallen hikers, they rescued 50,000-year-old trees. 
and brought up sample for me. That's Jeremy Stinson, who used to be our park ranger and later our supervising ranger on the Sonoma coast, uh, attached to the rope, carefully removing some wood for me. And there's a close up of Jeremy and you can see the fossil wood that he's collecting a sample of. Now, who knew there was a fossil forest or at least an ancient forest under Bodega Head? Anybody? Raise your hand if you did. I didn't. So I took these cones and they were in really good condition. And I got to thinking, what's the chance I could germinate a seed? And I started doing research. And I learned that people could actually germinate ancient seeds if they knew what they were doing. I heard about a lupin from Alaska that was, I think, 12,000 years old that sprouted in the lab. And I heard about some ancient lotus seeds from China uh, that were germinated by a scholar, I think at UCLA. So I started talking about germinating the seeds. And a, a reporter friend of mine, Bob Norberg, ended up talking to me, heard about it. And he wrote an article about my plans to germinate a seed, a 50,000-year-old seed. And he got into the paper. And back then, the Press Democrat was owned by the New York Times. So the day after the article was published, they put it out in the wire service, and it went all over. It went crazy, actually. And I started getting contacts from scientists uh, all over the world saying, eh, it's going to be hard to do, but if you do this and do that, you might be successful. And several people volunteered to help me develop some protocols for germinating a 50,000-year-old seed. This article here is actually in Orlando, Florida. It got picked up. But I had contacts from the Middle East and um, from Asia and, and other places outside the country. Pretty remarkable when a story like this goes viral. Um, I wish there could have been a follow-up story saying, yes, Breck Parkman was successful. He grew a 50,000-year-old Sitka spruce tree. But that wasn't to be the case. The 33rd cone I call, I actually named the seed Bruce the Spruce before the seed was germinated. I named it Bruce the Spruce. And that's the one from this cone here I, attempt, I attempted to germinate. At the same time, my wife was carrying our son. And my son was born in early March of 2006. And being a romantic, I thought, how grand if I can germinate Bruce the Spruce and have Bruce appear at the same time my son appears. Unfortunately, I made a fatal mistake in the germination attempts by allowing the seed to dry improperly, and it was catastrophic for my experiment. Fortunately, my son was born healthy, and in the end, that's what really mattered. But maybe someday I'll, I'll do another. There's more cones and more seeds at Berkeley, and maybe I'll get another chance, or someone else will get a chance to germinate and grow a 50,000-year-old Sitka spruce tree. I think that would be pretty cool. Now, also from Bodega Head is this pine cone. Our curators were going through the attic of the call house at Port Ross years ago, and they found a box, and in it was a plastic bag with this pine cone and a note. And the note says, Monterey Pine found at Bodega Head by F.H. Slim Bauer in 1952. Well, Slim Bauer was writing his master's thesis on the geography or geology combination of the Sonoma Coast. And I think he was at Berkeley and he was doing survey and he was finding interesting things, archaeological sites, and in this case, a paleontological site. And he collected this pine cone. And then he writes that it was closed when he first found it, but it opened later. That's what these pine cones do. When they come out of the ground, they're closed. And then as they dry, they open up. And that's why this one's opened up. Um, interesting. I would like to have known more about the discovery. In his notes, he says it was found with redwood logs. So apparently it's part of this redwood forest out there, but it includes pines as well, at least in this case. Now, there's a possibility, there's a good possibility that the forest that I envision at Bodega Head actually is mostly float material that came down in a river or creek there and was deposited. I'm not certain yet. Uh, I need smarter people than me or better trained people than me to look at the geomorphology and determine if it's an in situ 
intact deposit or if it's a secondary redeposited deposit. I notice all these trees sticking out of the cliff are all oriented the same way. And that could be telling. I had some of the wood radiocarbonated using the AMS method at the Lawrence Livermore National Lab. And here are the dates. If just looking at the pine cone, here we ran two dates on each of these samples. This date, um, oops, I can't see my date because it goes off the screen under everybody's pictures, but it was right around 50,000 years old, as was most of the samples that we studied. There's one inconsistency in here where there's a, a funny date of 35,000. But overall, the AMS date suggests that this conglomeration of trees and cones is about 50,000 years old. Now, you might ask, what is AMS? The technique of accelerator mass spectrometry, or AMS, is a technique for measuring ratios of high selectivity, sensitivity, and precision. In general, AMS separates a rare radioisotope from stable isotopes and molecular ions of the same mass using a variety of standard nuclear physics techniques. Now, what does that mean? I have no idea, but here's a drawing showing how the AMS works. I'm just glad that there's people you could work with, like the people at the lab, who know how to do this. So that's the first part of this story. That's the Sitka spruce, 50,000 years old, found at Bodega Head. And it's still out there. It's still, if you could, if you had x-ray vision, you could look into the ground out there, you would see that Sitka spruce and you would see other trees still out there in the ground. And as years go by, and as more and more storms hit the coast, and possibly the water rises more, uh, it's going to expose more and more of this. Now, the second site is at Sugarloaf Ridge State Park. And probably a lot of you have been to Sugarloaf. If you haven't been to Sugarloaf, you owe it to yourself to go for a hike someday. It's a wonderful park. Uh, at the end of the last ice age, during the last glacial maximum, when the ocean was the lowest, Sugarloaf was about 60 miles inland. It's not quite that much today. And here I am in 2006, wading up Sonoma Creek. Now, what am I doing? This is January the 11th. Well, some of you who've been here long enough remember the New Year's Eve storm of December 31st, 2005, and January 1st of 2006. I lived at Sugarloaf at the time. I was in the state house there. And overnight, we got nine inches of rain. And the water thundered down the creek. It flooded, uh, did a significant amount of damage. And here I am a few days later, once the water's gone down where I can safely go up the creek, I'm surveying. And over the next couple of months, I surveyed all the creeks and all the rivers in my area of responsibility and found a lot of really interesting things. But I think... In hindsight, I think what I found at Sugarloaf is probably my favorite because this is where I found some pine cones. Now, normally, pine cones wouldn't get me all that excited. I like pine cones, but these pine cones proved to be about 25,000 years old. And there's a story here, and I'll tell you. Here's what I found. So we saw the blue clay at Bodega Head. And here again, coming up the creek, I'm looking at the about a 20 foot exposure up to the top of the bank. And down at the bottom, there's a blue clay. And sticking out of the clay are little bits of pieces of black wood. Black because it's aging, but it's definitely wood. And it didn't wash in, it's washing out. I did radiocarbon dating on this side as well. And I found that specimens taken from up near the top of the blue clay are about 18,000 years old and specimens found or collected from the base of it, or what I think was the base, as deep as I could get uh, down underwater, uh, are about 20, 27,000 years old. What excites me about those dates is they encompass what we call the last glacial maximum. The last glacial maximum was the last time during the glacial period that the ocean was the deep or the lowest and the temperatures were the coldest. And after this last glacial maximum, the world began to warm, the ice began to melt, 
and the seas began to rise. But this was the last glacial maximum here. I don't know what that means, but I know enough about science to know there's a potential to figure out some things uh, with what I collected here. Now, oh, Calvin. Calvin's right about paleontologists dating million year old fossils by their geological context. Archaeologists use the radial carbon dating method, providing dating samples, providing dating samples are less than about 60,000 years old. But here's Calvin, uh, one of my favorite cartoon strips. Here's the radial carbon dates for the sugarloaf cones. Actually, I didn't date the cones. I dated pieces of wood associated with the cones. And here's the date that's approximately 18,000 years old from near the top of the deposit. Some of you who've worked with radial carbon dating can look at this and understand. Uh, I just look at that calibrated BP here to understand that this is about 18,000 years old. That's enough for me. And here's the lower date of about 27,000 years ago. And this was as far as I could get down. This is like, at the time, the water was probably a couple feet deep. And I'm collecting sample from underwater coming out of the very base of the deposit. The deposit's about 90 centimeters thick. And by deposit, I mean this blue clay that's rich with old wood. But the truth is, if the creek was drained and I had a backhoe, which I wouldn't do, and I trenched the base of the creek, it probably goes down even more. But for what I looked at, it's about a 90 centimeter deposit, 27,000 at the bottom, 18,000 at the top, as far as the dates go. Here you can see it again, the blue clay as outlined here. Uh, there was about a oh, 10 meter, 30 foot long section uh, visible when I first found it. Now look at what I call the slide scar up here. You can stand in the creek and it's hard to see in the photo, but there's actually a, a scar of a slide. And from the looks of it, it's an ancient slide. It slides every now and then, but it's been there for a long time. And I kind of wondered, did a slide bury the wood that I later found? Not really sure yet. Another thing for a or a uh, paleo for a soils person, I can't get the word out tonight. Now here's the funny thing. So I found the slide in January 2006, and I took a few samples. And I didn't do any more. And then I got a radiocarbon date and I realized, oh my gosh, this is a really an old, old deposit. So later that summer, I went back out to see if I could collect some more material. And to my horror, I discovered that after I'd last been out there, one more rainstorm had created a new landslide and it completely buried over the exposed blue clay. And you can see it there. Uh, nothing was visible except a little, little patch. So it's like, well, if I wait, eventually there will be another flood. And my suspicion is that the new flood will wash out the toe of the landslide, allowing me to see the blue clay again. And in fact, that did happen. I had to wait a few years, but it did happen. Happened, I think, in 2014. So when I went back out, once the blue clay was visible again, I collected as much of the sample as I could this time. First time, I only collected two or three pieces of wood because I wasn't certain it was ancient wood. I thought it was, but I wasn't certain. But once I radiocarbon dated the site and realized it was, when I had an opportunity to salvage more material, that's what I did. And that's what you're seeing here. Now, I can't identify all the wood. There's, there's probably a dozen species of plant material here, but I do see Douglas fir and I see pine and I see redwood. And I, there were a few other things I found. I would love someday to see a paleobotanist or whatever the scientist is that studies old wood tell us what type of trees these are. And that could be done. Now, here are a couple of the Douglas fir cones I found on the left. There were quite a few Douglas fir cones, um, over 100 if I recall correctly. And here's what I think is probably a juniper cone also found. So there's a variety of plant material in the site and also in the collection that I created uh, that hasn't really been analyzed yet. And I found six pine cones, and here's five of them uh, in a screen um, after being collected. Anywhere else, a pine cone 
wouldn't get my attention this much. But coming out of a um, an area that I've already dated to the last glacial maximum, it was kind of excited, exciting. And one of the cones, the one at the upper left, I could clearly tell was a Monterey pine. And that really spoke to me. And I'll tell you why in just a minute. Today, to see a natural stand of Monterey pine, you have to go down to the Monterey area, Monterey Peninsula, uh, Ano Nuevo South, to see native Monterey pines. We have Monterey pines in Sonoma County, but they're considered exotic or out of place. To see the natural ones, you have to go south. Now, here's one of the cones. This is interesting. Here's one of the cones I found. And look at the evidence of bark boring beetles. You can see some of the holes here. A lot of the wood I found, especially the pine, is riddled with the, the, the scarring of bark boring beetles. You can go into the forest today and see the same thing. Here's a, a modern tree with some of the evidence. And in fact, the bark boring beetles are doing a lot of damage especially as the forests suffer from drought. Uh, Bark-borne beetles, pine beetles, live for about a year. This kind of shows their cycle. I've been trying to put it all together and figure out, can the bark-boring beetle signs tell me when these trees were standing and when they fell? And they may be able to. I haven't figured out how to do that yet. But the bark-boring beetles are adults in summer. I know that. So to make those holes they had access to the trees in summer. That may or may not be significant. More modern evidence of what they do. Now, fossil cones from Monterey Pine have been found before. What I found at Sugarloaf is not the first time fossil pine cones have been found. Monterey pines. You can see on this map here where fossil Monterey pines have been found in past times. And you can see up here, up in our area, there's a cluster on the Sonoma Marin coast, mostly the Marin coast, and in the Bay Area on the peninsula. What's unique about our discovery at Sugarloaf is the fact that it's an interior site. During the last glacial maximum, it was 60 miles from the ocean. That may or may not be significant, but I feel like it might be because all the other fossil cones are on the coast. Now, it may be that that's the only place people have looked for them. And it might be that we'll find more old Monterey pine cones in the interior if we start looking for them. There's only one fossil Monterey pine known from the interior, and that's down here in interior Riverside County. And that, that pine cone happens to be from the Miocene. It's uh, millions of years old. So it doesn't really count. It's something different. The world, California, 5 million, 25 million years ago was very different than the last 50,000 years. So essentially, the cones from Sonoma Creek are unique in the fact that they're from the interior. These are just pines in California. You know, in California, we have something like two thirds of the pine species known. And if you look up at number one, you'll see the, Mon I've got it labeled number one. Here's a Monterey pine. And number two is the Bishop pine. And number nine is the Knobcone pine. And then finally, number 17, uh, used to be called the Digger pine, it's now called the Gray pine. We have Gray pines, Knobcone pines living in the park today, up high up on the ridges but we have no Monterey Pines there. They're considered exotic. In California, we have a closed pine forest, closed cone for pines forest. And these are the three, the, the Monterey Pine, the Knobcone Pine, and the Bishop Pine. So here are the, here are the cones I actually found. Um, SRSP-P-06-1, is my own designation. This stands for Sugarloaf Ridge State Park dash paleontology dash 2006 dash one, meaning it was the first and only paleontological site I found in 2006 at Sugarloaf. 
Now I'm an archaeologist. Normally I'm finding archaeological sites which get recorded a different way. So I came up with this method for old pine cones. So this is cone number one. Here's cone number two. And this is cone number three. You see, some of these are kind of ratty. I mean, I would be too if I lay in that bank for 25,000 years. But they're, you know, they, they've suffered over time, mostly from erosion most recently. Here's cone number four. That's the one that's obviously Monterey Pine, or I think it is. Cone number five. And cone number six. Um, this is Dosha Dodd from Sonoma State who worked with me on identifying the pine cones a couple years ago. So here's Dosha in the lab with the six pine cones. And we measured and did everything we could. Um, you can see at the bottom of the photo here, here's a couple of scales and this bag's full of scales. As the cones came out of the ground and dried, uh, some of the scales would fall off. And we try to keep all the scales with the cones, to keep everything together. Here's a close up of a scale, and you can see the wing still on it, and but the seed's missing on this one here. So, you know, the morphology of a pine cone, you have the scales, which are those little things around the edge of or the side of the pine cone, and the wing and the seed are on the scales. And when it's ready, the wing takes off and flies away with the seed on it, and that's how it propagates. It takes off. The fact that the wing is on this scale makes me think that this tree died at a certain time of the year before the seeds were dispersed, and maybe something came along and ate the seed, or it didn't It didn't survive. Here's another scale on the right, and you can see a bark boring beetle hole through it. Here we are. We went down to the California Academy of Sciences, Dosh and I did. And we, we didn't take our pine cones, but we took really good photographs of our pine cones and we laid them out. And with the um, Academy's help, we went through the comparative collections of pine cones. And the Academy has all types of pine cones and all kinds of every other type of plant imaginable. Um, but here we are and we're sorting and looking through and we're trying to match up the best we can. And we're not paleobotanists, you know, we're archaeologists. And but by matching them up, we start getting an idea of what's what. Um, here I am looking at one of their pine cones here. And it was kind of a slow process, but it was fun. And at the end of the process, we took our six pine cones and we did our best. We said cone one is unidentified. We couldn't figure it out. Cone two is unidentified. We couldn't figure it out either. Cone three, we think is a knob cone pine. Now there's knob cones up on the ridge a couple miles away, but this isn't a modern knob cone. It's definitely coming out of the clay. So it's an ancient knob cone if it is. Now cone number four uh, looked like a hybrid to us. Monterey pine for sure, but maybe with something else. And in cones five and six, we were pretty certain were Monterey pine. Now, we may or may not be right, but having the cones protected, you know, future pine scholars can look at them and, you know, correct us if it needs to be corrected. But it's a beginning. Here's the cone of a modern knob cone, and above is the cone of a Monterey pine, just to give you an example. And um, yeah, above is the mob, and to the left is the Monterey pine. So there's a pine called the KMX pine. It's a hybrid of a Monterey and a knob cone. And they occur in commercial forests where you have the two trees growing side by side. They hybridize. I don't know that that can happen in the wild. I couldn't find any indication of that. But one of our cones looks like it's kind of Monterey pine, and it looks like it's kind of knob cone pine. And we wondered if it was a hybrid. And that's what the hybrids look like, those three there. That's a question for some future paleobotanist to figure out. Uh, it was bigger than we could, but at least we think that's what it is.
the last glacial maximum. So here's the last glacial maximum at 18,000 years ago. And you can see on the left where the ice is. We didn't have glaciers here in our area. You had to go up to Yosemite and then further north in the Cascades to see glaciers. If anything, certainly the weather was different here during the last glacial maximum than it is today, but it wasn't as severe as it was in the interior, like Montana or Nevada or, you know, Alberta. Uh, but it was still different weather. It was cooler, drier. Uh, but look at the figure on the right at the exposed coastline. That's what's really interesting in telling the story. During the last glacial maximum, the sea was about 120 meters lower than it is today, almost 400 feet. And by dropping the ocean 400 feet around the world, you expose a lot of land that's currently submerged. And here in our area, and you can see it right up here, there's this broad shelf that was exposed here in the last glacial maximum. When I gave a talk three years ago to Sonoma Land Trust, I talked about the Serengeti, the California Serengeti, and I talked a lot about this area out here. If you can see my cursor. And I call this the Farallon Plain. It goes from down in Monterey Bay up to northern uh, into Mendocino County. And it measures about 2 million acres. And it would have been prime pasture for big grazing animals like bison and mammoth. And that's what we talked about three years ago. Here's another look at the submerged, currently submerged, but back then exposed coastal pasture that I call the Fairline Plain and the types of animals that lived out there. We're over here, Bodega Heads, just off the side here. 18,000 years ago, you could walk from downtown San Francisco to the Cordell Bank or the Fairline Islands. You could actually walk out there. 30 something miles, 35 miles. Up in our area, uh, it wasn't as broad, but it was still maybe 10 to 12 miles in most areas of the Sonoma Coast that you could walk out where you can now. What did that look like? Here's a photograph courtesy of the BBC. A few years ago, I worked on a BBC documentary. And um, here they're out at Point Reyes with Stephen Edwards, who's a, a very well-known, respected botanist. Um, and he's showing them an area that has mostly native grasses, sedges, and bunch grasses, and similar to what that landscape would have looked like during the late Pleistocene. And in my mind, as part of the California Serengeti, this was just prime real estate if you were a big grazing animal. It was a good place to go, especially in the summer when it's warming up inland and the plants are starting to desiccate a bit and not as tasty. You come out to the coast to eat, kind of like the Serengeti Plains today with the mass migrations. We had something similar to that here. So again, here's the, the plain, the Fairlawn Plain. Last glacial maximum 20,000 years ago is shown here as 110 meters below sea level. This is where the coast was. Uh, and then as you go through time, 14,000 years, it comes up, 13,011. And the coast pretty much stabilized 79, 8,000 years ago to what we know now with minor, minor corrections. So this is the upper area of Sugarloaf. This photo isn't, this is a stock photo I used. But in looking at Sugarloaf, we have a... a we had what I think was the mixed coniferous forest there. And that would explain redwood and Douglas fir and Monterey pine, along with some of the broadleaf trees that show up in this collection, or what I think are broadleaf trees in the, the fossil collection from Sugarloaf. Very different environment than what you just saw at Point Reyes. So here is deglaciation, the timeline. And this green area here, this is where the fossil trees or the old trees from Sugarloaf occur with the last glacial maximum, just to give you an idea. And then we come into the Holocene uh, and up until the present. So it's a significantly old deposit. It's not old enough to be fossil trees like Yellowstone or 
and petrified forest. But if we wait along, if you come back in 50 million years, some of those trees at Bodega Head and some of those pine cones at Sugarloaf will be fossils. The wood material will have been replaced by minerals and it'll feel like stone. But you got to come back in 50 million years or at least 5 million years. And personally, I don't know if we have that much time. Hopefully we do. But here is an interesting um, graphic. If you look here, you see A, B, and C. A is the Bodega Head Sitka Spruce. B is the Bodega Head Pine Cone. And C is the Sugarloaf Pine Cones. And it kind of shows where the radiocarbon dates suggest they show. This is the um, last glacial maximum right here. This is when the ocean's the lowest. And these fines are going down this slope. 50,000, uh, 50,000, 25,000. And they're coming down the slope here. This is where we're at today. The ocean's back up here. Look at what happened 125,000 years ago. Um, we had a high water that was about four meters or 16 feet higher than today. And if you go out to the Sonoma Coast and take a walk on the Cordon Trail and look at the cliff face, you'll see a sheared off foundation rock, just as flat as a pancake going for a couple miles. That was from the water action shearing it off 125,000 years ago when the sea came up. But here we are, and here's what we're looking at. Look at this red. Um, this may be what we're doing with greenhouse gases to affect the interglacial and maybe eventually to bring about the next glacial period sooner than it would have been. I can't see all of my screen because I see myself and other people on the right, but let me recall what this shows. This is an aerial photograph of our area, Sonoma County, and the yellow dot at the far left is that Sitka spruce tree site. And at the far right, the other yellow dot is the pines from Sugarloaf, which we just talked about. But look at these two red dots. This red dot here on the left is just outside Sebastopol above the Laguna de Santa Rosa. And years ago, I talked to someone who drilled a well and they said, we got down 125 feet and we were pulling up pieces of redwood that still looked like redwood. And I thought, well, isn't that odd? Never got dated, no, no dating on it. Yesterday, a friend contacted me who's in the room tonight, my friend Chris, and she said, I want to tell you a story. Years ago, my family had to put in a new well because the well went dry, and it, they, we had to drill a 1,000 feet to get water. They live in the middle of Bennett Valley, and she said at 850 feet, we hit redwood, and it looks like redwood. And being a scientist, she took samples and sent it to a radiocarbon lab. And it came back that the redwood was 13,000 years old. Now, I find that intriguing. What's the chance we had a redwood forest where Bennett Valley is now? Or where Sebastopol is? It's quite likely. It could have been a mixed forest with redwood and duck fir and Monterey pine. But if you look at the historic period and the redwoods along the Russian River and Guerneville and up on the coastal ridge, uh, it's quite likely that we had a, a pretty incredible redwood forest where Bennett Valley is now. Speaking of that, I propose to anyone that does well drilling, you know, check what comes out of the wells. And if, if wood comes out, let's find a way of tracking that. There are so many wells being driven all, drilled all the time in the North Bay. And how many times do they pull up wood and they don't think about it? It would be great to get a handle and a sample on some of that just to understand more about these ancient forests. Now, this photo shows me in the creek again at Sugarloaf years ago, picking up another fossil or old ancient pine cone, another one from uh, Monterey Pine. And it had recently washed out of the bank that was on top of a sand dune or a, a sandbar. It was still wet and closed. It had only been out for a while. And it was about 100 meters or 100 yards upstream from the other site. And what that told me is that the other site, where all these ancient pieces of wood are coming from, is bigger than I thought. Uh, it actually might take up the entire creek, as far as we know. But this is the seventh cone. And I got to thinking about that. And I thought, here are some things to consider. Familiarity creates knowledge. The more you go out and look, the more you know. And knowledge informs perspective. If 
you look at the world through knowledge, um, it informs that perspective. And that perspective shapes your decisions. The more you know, um, I think the better decisions you make. And here's what I mean by that. Now, there's two photos. I'm in both photos. I don't normally like being in photos, but I need to do this one. So on the left, there I am helping remove a living, and I put in quotes, exotic Monterey pine that was growing too near the state residence, which happened to be the house I lived in, uh, at Sugarloaf. And this is September 2003. That was a really big Monterey pine. It was planted during the ranching days. It had already extended its life. It was past the, the average lifespan of Monterey pine. And it loomed above this double white I lived in. And um, every winter when there were storms, the first couple of years I lived there, I'd go out and I'd watch this tree just sway. And it's like, you know, someday it's going to fall and I'm going to probably get squished or my wife or our dogs and later our child. Uh, the ecologists I worked with had wanted to remove it, but I'd said, no, you know, it's, it's a good tree. It's healthy. It's historic. But when I realized, I did some research and realized Monterey pines don't live as long as I knew that tree was or tend to, I said, you know, if you still want to remove it, I'm aboard. And we took it out two days later. And we took it out because it was a hazard tree. It was old and it was within striking distance of the house. But we mainly took it out because it was an exotic. It wasn't supposed to be there. We knew that Monterey pine does not grow in the Mayacama Mountains. It's an exotic. The photo on the right is me three years later, September 2006, wading the creek, looking for Monterey, ancient Monterey pine trees. And it was like, if I had known three years earlier that the Monterey pines were actually natives and not exotics, we might have still had to take it down because it was a danger, but we would have taken it down with more thought, I think. And it's just funny how these things work sometimes. Let me just, in the time I've got left, and there's only a few minutes here, I think, talk about global climate change. And we're all, most of us are shocked at what we're seeing with the world's climate changing. And we wonder, what does the future hold for us? Already, global climate change is forcing flora and fauna to adapt, migrate, or risk going extinct. This graphic is too complicated to read, but if you come back and look at YouTube, this talk on YouTube, you can pull this one up. These are just some of the responses that climate change scientists are already noting among flora and fauna, where animals are moving, are dwindling, going extinct, um, changing their patterns, and it'll only increase. This is from 2014. Animals and plants are fleeing climate change migrating toward the poles at 20 centimeters per hour. That comes out to about, what did I figure? I wrote a note down here. That comes out to, oh, a mile a year. So animals are already moving about a mile a year on average, moving their territory toward the poles, North and South Pole, depending on where you're at. That's something to be aware of. Trees migrate or withdraw too, as we've already seen. There's the Sitka spruce are now found 90 miles north of Bodega Head, and the Monterey pines are found 100 miles south of Sugarloaf. And that's why now they're considered exotics and not natives, but truth is they're natives. They've just temporarily withdrawn. And already we're seeing the same thing with human populations, migrating, withdrawing, fleeing. So now for something completely different, the Dawn Chorus. The Dawn Chorus is that beautiful sound you hear in the morning when the birds first wake up. And to ideally hear it, you want to go out in the woods, in the forest, but you can also go in your backyard before the sun comes up. So you're going to be out there in complete darkness and get quiet and listen. And as the first little beginning of the light starts, the birds wake up and they sing for happiness. And it's a chorus, and it's called the Dawn Chorus, and it's actually beautiful. Probably a lot of you know what I'm talking about.
Um, in our area, we have an incredible resource named Bernie Krause. Dr. Krause uh, is many, many things, but one thing he is, he's a soundscape natural ecologist, I forget what the word is. And this is one of the microphones that Bernie uses at Sugarloaf to record the Dawn Chorus. He's been doing that for 30 years. He's written a bunch of books, including this great book called The Great Animal Orchestra. I think that's what it says. It's hiding behind my face. Um, in recent years, Bernie wanted to make sound visible. And he came up with this installation that's traveling around the world. Here it is in San Francisco recently, in which you can see sound. So this is a record. He does recordings all over the world. This is a recording, and I forget where this recording is. Could be Africa, could be Argentina, could be actually Sugarloaf. And the lights display every time a, a, an animal or a bird or makes a sound, you see the lights and the frequency and all. And it's very visual in addition to, you know, you can hear it. And some of us went down with Bernie recently to see it. Uh, and this is just a photo I took. Splendid. And here is Bernie up here in the top describing the process of recording the animal orchestra, which includes the Dawn Chorus. Now, those familiar with Sugarloaf have hiked out and there's a big bridge on Sonoma Creek in the back country on Meadow Trail. And there used to be an incredible big leaf maple growing there. In the early 90s, I was asked to escort two botanists out that came out from back east. And they'd heard about this tree and they wanted to measure it because they had heard it was the biggest maple west of the Mississippi. I never heard if they determined that, but that's what they thought it was. Well, the tree is suffering now for wear. Um, drought was probably already hurting it, but the 2017 Nuns fire and the 2020 Glass fire both burned the tree, and it's all but gone now. This tree was splendid. The bird life here was just, it was amazing. And for one reason, that's why Bernie, for 30 years, has recorded just over off the picture to the right, uh, the birds. This is where the Dawn Chorus has been recorded in Sugarloaf for so long. Um, Bernie told me the last two years he's gone up to do the Dawn Chorus, it's been quiet. I've been up with them before when it was loud. I mean, for our time, loud. If you could go back 500 years ago and hang out with the Mishwa Wapo people, the indigenous people, the forest must have been so beautiful and loud with all the birds. But we understand that we've lost so many of our songbirds over time. But even what still exists is beautiful when they're all seen. But for the last couple of years, we haven't heard that. And it could be because of drought and the fire and development and all the different things that work towards forcing birds to go elsewhere or disappear. Um, I find it very interesting, though, that these old ancient pine cones are showing up in the creek just a couple hundred yards from where Bernie's been recording the Dawn Chorus, and now is discovering silence. Just like I'm discovering the absence of Monterey Pine today, but there was a time when there were a lot of Monterey Pine at Sugarloaf, just like there was a time there were a lot of songbirds there. This is way too long to read. So maybe you can read this on YouTube someday. But it essentially says, you know, what's going on? I, I, I've been involved with Sugarloaf for over 40 years. And I lived there for 15 years. And every night I'd walk out on the porch and I'd look at the stars at night. We chose Sugarloaf for the Robert Ferguson Observatory because of the relatively dark skies at night. Sugarloaf, the upper part of Sugarloaf is kind of like a little Yosemite. It's an upper valley surrounded by higher ridges and peaks that blocks out ambient light. But over the years I lived at Sugarloaf, I saw that the ambient light grew as the cities of Napa, Petaluma, Santa Rosa um, grew in Sonoma. More people, more lights, and the sky got a little lighter. At the same time, the forest was getting drier. I, I saw it when sudden oak death came in, followed by you know an invasion of bark boring beetles. And all of a sudden we have all these dead trees. And then we start having these incredible wildfires in recent years. And now Bernie says the, the Dawn Chorus is falling away. So there's a lot happening at Sugarloaf. And Sugarloaf is just sort of a microcosm of our world. You can go a lot of places in the world 
and find very unusual things going on, things that we need to take note of uh, while we can. I like this. I, I've always figured that we have an affinity for trees, a community of people, a forest of trees. We have so much in common. Lucy, one of our earliest ancestors, actually lived in a tree, climbed out of a tree three million years ago. Um, our earliest ancestors came out of trees. Someday, if the water comes up, we may have to climb back up in trees. Who knows? But on the left here is a human fingerprint, and on the right is a tree cut across. And just look at the similarities. Now, I'm not saying we're trees, and I'm not saying trees are human, but we do have a lot in common with trees. They just can't talk, not to us. We can talk for them. Here's Lucy's people three million years ago, coming out of the trees, going back into the trees, living near the trees until they were sufficiently capable of living out on the plains and protecting themselves. Our ancient ancestors had an intimate relationship with trees. But today, I wonder how many of us can see the trees we live with. Can you see the trees? I mean, we see the forest. Can we see the trees? In conclusion, groups like the Sonoma Land Trust help us to see the trees and the many natural wonders that surround us. Like the Lorax, groups like the Sonoma Land Trust speak for the trees. That's just one of many reasons to support them. It's been an honor speaking to all of you tonight, and to have done so on behalf of the Sonoma Land Trust makes it all the better. I want to thank you one and all. And that's all, folks. I'll turn it back over to Neil. Thank you, Breck. Well, that was absolutely fascinating. Thank you for sharing so much with us. Um, and for those in the audience, if you have questions that you have been itching to answer, please submit them in the Q&A section. Uh, that button's at the bottom of your screen. Um, before um, you all leave or before we end, before we move on to question and answers, I just have a, a few uh, comments before we move on. Um, you can stay engaged with the Land Trust by following all of our social media accounts, um, typically at Sonoma Land Trust, or by visiting our website. You can also keep an eye out for more of our monthly Language of the Land webinars by uh, going to our website, sonomalandtrust.org slash outings. The Land Trust, as you've heard tonight from both myself and Breck, uh, is a nonprofit organization, which means we rely on donations from individuals, businesses, and foundations to make our work possible. If you heard like what you've heard today, please consider donating. We are at the end of our calendar year, which means we are at the beginning of our end of year fundraising cycle. We have a $1.6 million target to hit, and we could use everyone's help making that uh, goal so that we can bring more programs like this and protect more land in Sonoma County. To make a donation to Sonoma Land Trust, just go to sonomalandtrust.org and click the donate button at the top. Thank you so much for your help. In addition, we are also in our feedback um, process this year. We're looking for feedback from you, our community. We currently have an audience survey that is open and we would love to hear from you. I will put that link in the chat right now. If you have 10 minutes at the end of the presentation, I'll also put it at the end of the presentation so you don't have to go to it now. Um, if you have 10 minutes, we would absolutely appreciate your input. It helps us improve our programs and improve our uh, strategies for our mission. With that, uh, we'll move on to question and answers. And I know we've got quite a few questions here um, and more are flowing in as I see. Um, Breck, I think I wanna start um, towards the beginning of your talk where some of those very first pieces of wood were found. You said it were on Bodega Head um, and somebody brought up uh, a question that actually I thought about too when you were talking about that. Um, the the hole in the head, the, the big hole where PG&E drilled a hole to, to make a, a nuclear power plant that luckily didn't go through. 
Do you know if they tracked anything? Did they pull anything up? Is there any way that we could look and see what kind of materials they were bringing up and to see if, because it's right in, right in where you were studying and wonder if they came across anything. What are your thoughts on that? That's a really good question. And it's actually one I've thought about. PG&E takes really good records. And I'm sure for a project like the Atomic Park, which is what they called that back then, they took really good records, especially the engineering. And it seems like the engineering folks would document what's in the ground. I haven't looked for that and I haven't seen that, but I would encourage anyone, maybe there's someone in the audience that wants to work with me on this, a student especially, or a retired person or whoever, maybe that's something we could do together. Here's what I do know. PG&E, as they did all this work out at Bodega Head, what we call the hole in the head, um, they did archaeology and they hired the late David Fredrickson, who was a well-known archaeologist, taught at Sonoma State for many years, uh, a friend of mine, a mentor of mine. They hired Dave to do archaeology to mitigate the impacts of the atomic park on the area's cultural resources. And Dave excavated a number of sites out there that were going to be affected destroyed properly by the project if it went forward. And I've looked at Dave's report and he wrote a report, um, I think it was 1961, but it was in the early 60s, talking about what he was finding. And I looked for it before this talk because I was going to actually put it in the slideshow and I couldn't find my report. But there's a paragraph in this report that says we excavated on the beach and we got down and we found um a cluster of redwood logs. Now, Dave thought, because in, in the early 1800s, the Russians had a port there, and they actually had a facility, including several structures at Campbell Cove. Dave thought that these were redwood logs that possibly the Russians were storing the ship away. But now I wonder, were those the fossil redwood logs? And I don't know how to find out. But in the engineering report, there should be hopefully something more about that. So good question. Yeah, the entire bodega head, if you go down, you know, 50 feet uh, or whatever, there should be uh, lots and lots of old trees. And the hole in the head almost certainly went through some of them. Yeah, another question asked about that. It, would more excavation of those sites help us be able to characterize what that forest was like? I mean, I hear you talking about a handful number of specific trees, but if, if we could dig down, would you be able to, you think we'd be able to characterize what was in that, that type of forest more than what you know? More samples would give you more information, but when a site is buried under 50 feet of material, it's really hard. You need something like pg e doing a nuclear reactor, <laughs> which I would encourage. So for my work, you could walk out on the beach and see the exposure and see what was sticking out. And from year to year, there'll be this or there'll be that. Um, but unless you went up and down that cliff with rescue equipment like Jer Jeremy Stenson was doing, I think it would hard, be hard to get a substantial collection so you could do that. Yeah. Um, but there's plenty sticking out and there's plenty in the collection that I created that's down at the Museum of Paleontology that hasn't been looked at. And it may be that that would be where you'd want to start. Same thing at Sugarloaf. You know, there's multiple species in the Sugarloaf collection as well. I've only identified the really easy ones. You know, yeah. there's other things that are in there that I haven't ID'd. But there are people that are trained to do that. It takes time. It takes specialists. And it takes money, usually. Uh, but if you have all those rowed up, you can do anything. Yeah, as a... As a... I say current museum nerd, but as a former staffer of the Academy of Sciences Museum nerd, a lot of people are surprised that a lot of new discoveries are made in collections, not out in the field. There's a lot of things in drawers that haven't been looked at. Um, and that's what I would encourage before going out and digging yeah. you know, into the earth, uh, which can be elaborate, can take a lot of consultation, permits, time and money. Just work on what's in collections already. I know I've created these two fairly large collections that are just dying for help. Someone needs to look at it before we go out to Bodega Head or Sugarloaf. And it may be that we don't have to do that if we go through the collections. And there are other collections like that, you know. Archaeologists have the same um, reality is that, you know, years, 100 years of archaeologists collecting and filling the museums up. 
now we're looking at a curation crisis and people are beginning to realize unless there's a specific reason we have to, we really shouldn't be digging in the ground. We should be preserving what's in the ground and dealing with all of this material that we've accumulated through the years. And the same holds for these old trees. Well, if there's any young people in the audience looking or anyone looking to go back to school, you heard it here. Find your local museum and uh, see if you can dig around in their collections first if you want to you want to name a new species. And I'd um, be glad to help you. I'd be glad. Just let me know. I'll let you know some introductions. Hey, and if a... you discover a new species, <laughs> you get to name it. And you could actually name it after yourself, you know, uh, if you wanted to. It's a now, little faux pas to name it after yourself. But you could name it after Breck if he helped. You could you name it. Out. Okay, that's, you know, who knows? No, I don't, I don't want it after. But, you know, you could name it after some famous scientists or whatever. Yeah. Um, you can name it after the Lorax for that matter. But here's the thing, all those little bark boring beetle holes, I have a feeling if you really analyzed all those cones and wood, you might discover a new species of beetle. Absolutely. That would be where I'd put my money. Uh, uh, trees, the trees, you know, maybe a hybrid tree that we don't know about, but it's the, uh, it's those bark boring beetles that we probably don't know a whole lot about. And we don't often get to see them in a context of ice age. An inordinate so, fascination with beetles or something yeah. like that. I forget what the quote is. Um, let's uh, move down. So you talked about walking down Sonoma Creek and finding, um, I believe it was Sonoma Creek, uh, finding some more pine cones. So a couple questions around that. So one person was asking, um, you know, if, if what you were finding was 18,000 years old, does that mean Sonoma Creek's been there for 18,000 years? Uh, that's a good question. I would assume it's been there or somewhere very near. Here's the shocking thing. 18,000 years isn't that much. Yeah. 18,000. I mean, um, it seems like a lot of time, but when you're dealing with earth history, 18,000 years actually was almost yesterday. Yeah. So the creek's been there. However, I did another project at Sugarloaf years ago in looking at naturally occurring obsidian pebbles that were sourced to a source in Napa that I think were deposited by a river that's no longer there five to 10 million years ago. So things do change, but it changes on a pretty large scale. The Mayakama Mountains have been there for a couple million years, and that's what Sugarloaf is. So those mountains that the creek flows through are several million years old, making me think that the drainage is as well, if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. Certainly 18,000 years. So when you were in that, um, when you were doing these searches and, and finding these specimens, you, you talked a lot about looking for uh, that blue clay. Can you talk a little bit about that? What characterizes that blue clay? Why are fossils found in there? Some people were asking, you know, they have blue clay on their property. Does that mean that might be a good place to look for these types of things? What do you know about why it's blue and why um, you found specimens there? I'm not really sure what makes it blue. Sometimes it's gray but it's an old ancient clay to become like that. And unless it's in a water area, and unfortunately Sugarloaf was you know, exposed to the creek and Bodega Head was exposed to big surf waves. So both of those sites were you know, wet sites, uh, but still things preserved. But if it's a interior blue clay and it's dry, uh, it's almost perfect preservation. And that's because there's a lack of oxygen. The worst thing for for artifacts and trees is to be wet part of the year, dry part of the year, and wet and dry back and forth. Uh, that breaks down, you know, things really fast. But if something is always wet, like in a bog, you'll discover it preserved thousands of years later. And if something's always dry, like in the desert, thousands of years later, you. I've worked in uh, southern Peru in the desert, and I've seen things in a desert landscape on the Chilean uh, Peruvian border that boggle the imagination that survived thousands of years. And I've also worked in some wet environments and it's the same thing, but it has to be one or the other, wet or dry. The blue clay often is a dry environment and an oxygen free environment. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, again, the sugar loaf and the bodega aren't good examples of that. Uh, but if you if you have blue clay on your land, keep your eyes open. I, I know of a, a mastodon tooth that came out of some blue clay on a ranch just outside Santa Rosa uh, a number of years ago. And I've heard of mammoth discoveries in blue clay. And when I went, I went through the records at the University of California Museum of Paleontology in Berkeley. That's a big mouthful. I went through their records looking at 
Rancho La Brea or late Pleistocene fossils, and they're all associated with blue and gray clays. When they get down to how it was found, this was found in some blue clay. And I don't know a lot about the blue clay, but that was a, an indicator to me to look for blue clay. So that's what I always did uh, when I was waiting around in Creek Small or looking at, you know, well drilling or anything like yeah. that. Um, there's some some questions close to my heart, again, as that museum nerd, about preservation. Um, so there's a question about how do you store kind of specimens like that? You, you talked about, you know, wet or dry and the back and forth is bad. So do, how have you been collecting your specimens, keeping from deteriorating? And then someone also was asking about Bruce the Spruce and wanting to know, you know, you mentioned about um, you, it dried too much. Do you know now what the, the right way of doing that is? You know, I, I created a system or a series of protocols, and it included creating an Arctic winter in my refrigerator, and then creating an Arctic spring in which I would bring it out, the seed out. The mistake with Bruce Spruce is I, I washed it in the driveway and laid it out in the sun to dry. And then, you know, months later, I realized, oh my gosh, that wasn't the thing to do. And uh, I didn't want to sacrifice any more cones. In fact, they were already on their way south to Berkeley. So the protocols uh, cover how to handle, how to store, and the whole wet-dry thing. And Arctic winter uh, is a certain temperature in the refrigerator that stabilizes and puts it into a deep sleep seed, which it's already in. And then bringing the seed out into an Arctic spring is a gradual warming process that allows the seed to wake up. If the seed's alive, seed has to be alive, that yeah. allows it to wake up. And so if anyone's interested in trying to do this, I'll be happy to share the protocols I came up with. Whether they will work or not uh, has to be determined. The best part but of the since then, this was 20 years ago. Since then, the newspaper has been full from time to time with stories that, you know, someone grows a 5,000 year old this and germinates an 8,000 year old this. And, um, you know, it's doable. But yeah. you have to handle the specimens correctly, which I didn't do at the time. And you have to have the protocols to give you the best chance of bringing them back to life. Yeah. Um, speaking of which, you, you know, many of those cones you had a hard time identifying. Someone was asking about data, uh, DNA analysis or some sort of atomic analysis. Is that, you know, are the, do you believe that the tissues are good enough that you'd be able to do that? And it's just a matter of resources and, and priority, or do you think those are, you know, that's not going to work out? For I think I think for the cones, it would be possible. It would just take the the specialist. It would take the time and it would take the funding, but DNA would be the way to go. And I had that suggested to me uh, by a number of scholars, but this was kind of a, a volunteer project. Both of them were kind of volunteer project. I never had really any funding for either of these. That's why you know I just wanted to collect the sample. And then let in the future someone do the right thing with it. So, you know, hopefully I've succeeded in that. And in the future, maybe someone will subject it to DNA or more, more dating. I'd like to date the six cones. I didn't date the cones at Sugarloaf. I dated wood material in association. It would be interesting to date the cones themselves and see. I think all six cones seem to come from the lower part of the deposit not the upper, but the dates would show that. And I think that would be an important thing to do, even before the DNA would be the radiocarbon date, all six of the cones, and see if they're all clustering, like I think around 25,000 years ago. Because part of the story I tell is the fact that they're from the lower part of the deposit and not the upper as the glacial maximum comes and then slowly changes. As the glacial maximum is disappearing and we're moving into the transition between the Pleistocene and Holocene, I think that's when the Monterey Pines are getting pushed out. Mm. And probably that's when the Sitka Spruce, maybe when the Sitka Spruce is getting pushed out, although the Spruce might have disappeared earlier. So need more data. Right now, they're just some big questions, but there's someone out there that could add, add, answer the questions, no can doubt. You, can you say a little bit more about that? There was some, there's some curiosity about the Monterey Pine. When do you think that was pushed out um, from the Sugarloaf area, my commas area, and was it due to the drier conditions, or was it due to that clim that larger climatic change, or what? What was that? I'm not sure. There's a lot of fossil or ancient Monterey pine on the Sonoma Coast 
and the Marin Coast, mostly the Marin Coast. And they've been excavated by paleontologists for the last hundred years, also in the San Francisco Peninsula. Sugarloaf is the only one from the interior, like I mentioned earlier. The What's happening on the coast probably is associated with the end of the last glacial maximum as the sea comes up. I've tried to visualize how you could have the pines and the redwoods out there, you know, 18,000 years ago or 50,000 years ago in the case of Bodega Head. Some of the, I think some of the pines or some of the sites are more like 30,000 years. And I'm not sure what the, what the mechanics are as the Pleistocene transitions into the Holocene that calls the disappearance. I suspect as a scientist, it's not one thing. It's probably a, a concert of things. And the end of the Pleistocene has to be part of it. Change in weather has to be part of it. Um, I don't know. Drought, fire. I know what does what's hurting the forest today, and it's drought. And that's creating big changes. The trees aren't leaving, but they're getting burned up and dying because of drought. Speaking of the, you know, the characterization of those groups, someone was asking about the looking in those blue clay layers and look and seeing if we could do like pollen analysis or my botany professor from many years ago will be mad at me. There is the name for poly polyology or something or other of, of well, ancient. Yeah, yeah. But that might I, took, I have a pollen sample from both sites oh. in storage, and uh, that hasn't been done. It should be done, and it can be done. Again, it just takes someone that can do it and the funding if necessary. The, um, the probability is that would tell us so much. There are a number of famous cores. There's something called the Clear Lake core uh, that goes back, I think, 125,000 years from Lake, from Lake County. And you can look at the results from that and see oak forests moving in. And 50,000 years ago, our forests were very similar to what they are today. There hasn't been that much change. What's changed is the boundaries of certain species. It's not like going back 10 million years ago at Sugarloaf when we had avocado trees growing in the forest and we had early rhinos running around. That's going back a long time ago and the forests were quite different then. But the last 50,000 years, the modern forests have been in place. It's just that the, the makeup has changed a little bit and that's all affected by weather and climate um, more than time. But pollen analysis would be the thing to do in addition to radiocarbon dating the cones. Then you get all sorts of other things out of there. The, you would see the things that we don't see with our eye. We don't that we don't have, you know, like the big pieces of wood. There's there's probably a dozen species of trees and um, shrubs in the collection from Sugarloaf, yeah. and I think I've identified maybe five of them. So there's that I can see. There's more, and then someone that knows what they're doing will see more, and then someone doing pollen analysis will add everything else probably. Well, uh, I'm up to pollen. like nine masters projects here <laughs> and i'm counting <laughs> <laughs> sounds like we got a lot of work to do um let's move for our last five minutes to some geology um you you know you're talking about that fairlawn plain and it was at the last glacial maximum is that around the time that the the bearing land bridge was kind of out there and working um and do you, did they kind of look the same or is it pretty far apart it's far apart as far as distance, um, vegetation, you know, I think the vegetation, it would have been, I would imagine if you could go to Beringia at the last glacial maximum, the, the piece of land that connected, you know, Asia and North America, um, it would have looked similar to the Farallon Plain in several ways. Vegetation would have been short and squat, and there would have been big dangerous animals out there with you. And the remarkable thing is that people like us were there and they survived. Yeah. That gives me hope for the future, that we are a species that can survive if we all get behind surviving and adapting and changing. But Beringia, uh, today, that area on the other side, you know, it's tundra. And yeah. it's a little different than our coastal prairies probably were. But back then, uh, it might have been more similar. Um. Pollenology. Thank you, anonymous attendee. Pollenology. P-A-L-Y-N-O-L-G-Y. Yeah. -E I'm sure I'm saying it wrong. Um, study of uh, pollen and spores. Yeah. Um, 
in our last three minutes here, I'll have one more question. And this one's a kind of a big one because it, it's also a curiosity of mine is uh, the fault lines and how that has changed the geography and geology of the, the coast area. So can these findings help us get a better idea of of how that ge geology and geography has changed along the, the fault line of San Andreas Fault and how that's shifted in land masses? Or, you know, you were talking about you know, it's on the Bodega Head, you were finding these specimens, but if those lands were moving from Southern California, does that actually mean that those specimens, but again, that's geologic time, so that might not even be reasonable. I'm just curious about how you might use these findings to, to help illuminate the geologic movements along our coast. That's a really good question, and I'm not sure I have a complete answer for that, but the Bodega Head site is on the Pacific Plate and the Sugarloaf sites on the North American plate and the San Andreas is just, you know, it's, it's Tamales Bay essentially. So uh, we just have a little sliver exposed of the um, Pacific plate at Bodega Head. And that's why we see the Grano diorite out there on the surface. And that's what PG&E was drilling through in their hole in the head. But the fact that uh, at Tamales Bay, there's a lot of fossil pine cones on the east side of the bay so that would be the North American plate. So we, it's not a case where the Monterey Pine are coming up from Southern California, even though today that's where you find them natural down in Monterey, because the time scale is not big enough. Um, they're moving. It's microscopic movement. I mean, it's still moving. The Pacific plate's moving north, but it's moving like a, um, an amoeba. So in 50,000 years time, it wouldn't have moved that much. But as far as geography and drainage, that's a really good point. At Sugarloaf, there's there's minor faults are kind of hard to say, but there's the Rogers Creek Fault west of the park, sort of under Sonoma Mountain and near Sonoma Mountain. And faulting changes drainages over time. But I'm still certain that Sonoma Creek up in the headwaters flows where it's always flowed. Mm -hmm. Further down out on the Sonoma Valley, maybe not, but where the cones are coming from, that's been pretty constant. But faulting... Yeah, faulting has the this potential river at Bodega Head that I envision that um, might have been there could have been Salmon Creek. Mm. And Salmon Creek has probably changed its flow because of the San Andreas over the years. It may be that 50,000 years ago, Salmon Creek emptied out into the Pacific, kind of where Bodega Head is now, and not where Salmon Creek empties out now. And that could explain these trees coming down and then getting stranded all parallel to one another. And then buried. Just, yes. But yeah, it could be faulting that would explain that site for sure. More so than Sugarloaf, I think. Well, thank you, Breck. I, I like to end um, question answer with a, a fun question of some sort. So my question to you is someone that knows Sonoma County and, the Cal and California so well, what's your favorite place in Sonoma County? You know, <clears throat> as I get older, it's home. <laughs> but by saying home, all of Sonoma County's home. I, I've been working here for about 50 years now and living here 40. And um, it feels like home to me. But to go somewhere, I love the Cordum Trail. Mm -hmm. If I'm going to go for a hike alone, just to think. And I love going around the Meadow Trail, Canyon Trail at Sugarloaf. Mm -hmm. But we are graced living here. You can go to any park and take a walk and be in heaven. Um, we assume that the world's like that, but I've lived and traveled in a lot of parts of the world that don't have that at their door to walk home. We, we're really blessed with our parks. Again, I, I credit a lot of this to Sonoma Land Trust and groups like this, uh, is special living here. So anywhere I go and if I get to take a walk, I love it and I'm home. But tonight I'm glad I'm home and I don't have to drive home. Uh, that's what I like about these Zoom talks. The benefit of, of Zoom. Well, like I like you just said, there's no better advertisement for the Sonoma Land Trust than what you just said. Thank you all for attending. Thank you all for being here. Thank you to our featured speaker, Breck Parkman. Thank you, Mariana, for the interpretation. Um, and thank you all out there. Appreciate your time. Thank you for your support. I also dropped that link in the chat for our audience survey. If you could take a moment to take that, that would be wonderful. And we will catch you all on the other side. Thank you. Good night. Good night.